Welcome, everybody, uh, and those online as well. Uh, it's my pleasure to be introducing Dominic Martz here today. Uh, Dominic Martz is one of the stars in Viz uh, recently, who's graduating right now. Uh, Dominic spent two summers interning with us, so he's a fairly well-known quantity, but he's done a lot of interesting work since he's even finished, so he'll be presenting some of that. Uh, he's currently finishing up his PhD uh, at UW with Jeff Hare. And I think before that, you did your undergraduate at House of Platner. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and Bill House also. And, and, so, and, and House of, okay, awesome. So uh, for those that are attending remotely, um, send me questions online. I'm not going to be running Teams, but uh, I'll be monitoring my email so that, that you can ask questions that way. So without further ado, welcome. All right, thanks, Steve. So this talk is about visualization and how I helped improve the way we create and think about visualizations. And to illustrate what I've done, let's look at how we usually make visualizations. This is how a prototypical data scientist would make a chart, let's say here for the precipitation in Seattle throughout the year. First, they would start by importing some libraries such as matplotlib, then read in the data set, filter to only Seattle because that's what we want to look at, then extract the month and the year from the data, aggregate it and then flatten it again, finally initialize the chart, and then draw the line for, for the chart here. And then once we've done that, we can start setting up the title and axis and so on, and finally show the chart. And there's a lot to be desired from making visualizations this way. And this becomes particularly obvious when we want to compare the data for Seattle with something like New York City. Now we have to add another group by here by the location. Add a color map that tells us what the different cities should be represented with. Then we have to draw a line for each city individually. And let's not forget the legend, because otherwise our readers won't know what the colors actually mean. And so a small change here in what we want to visualize entails changes to the data processing as well as the rendering. And even though we went through all this effort, the plot that we made in the end is a static plot. If you wanted to make this chart interactive, we would probably have to rewrite it in something like JavaScript. This also was Python code. In R, this would look very different. And the issue here is that you would essentially have to rewrite it because the specification is bound to the low-level specification of how this language works. It's also hard to optimize this code because we're interleaving the specification and the execution. So if you wanted to run the same visualization for all cities in the world, this probably wouldn't scale. The issue here is that the system doesn't really have any way to optimize it because it doesn't have any flexibility about how it's executing things. And at the end of the day, we don't even know whether the chart that we've made is actually a good design. For instance, we could have forgotten the legend, and the tool doesn't really provide us any feedback and tells us that we might have forgotten something. The challenge for the designer is that for any good design, like this chart here, there are a number of poor designs, like the one where we're forgetting the legend, or where we're using colors that imply some kind of order between the data that's, that's not really there or the one where we're using dots instead of lines. And here, you have to actively read the chart. Your fast object recognition system can't kick in and help you uh, get, see what these, uh, how these two cities differ. And these are just a few examples of many, many other possible designs that you might create. And so faced with this challenge of these visualization tools that we have, for my PhD, I set out to answer this question. How do we create the next generation of visualization systems where users can rapidly create good designs? Data analysts today rely on visualizations to reveal patterns in the data, and so it's important for the systems to not be in the way of rapid exploration. At the same time, good visualization tools should prevent us from making bad design decisions and instead encourage effective design. However, tools that we have lack consideration of perceptual principles and so can't help us doing that. And the scale of data analysts that analysts need to work with has far outpaced the tools that they use. But as the world is drowning in data, we need to have new tools that work at the required scale. However, tools often fail to provide either of these two things, so the guidance or the scalability. And the fundamental problem is that for our visualization tools are designed for manual authoring, like languages like matplotlib or, um, or ggplot and others. 
Good design, however, is then the responsibility of a designer. And we teach visualization design through classes or books or, or by experience, but our tools do not provide any computational guidance and don't really help us with that. So what I've done is to expand this triangle and figure out ways to design domain-specific languages where people and systems can meaningfully participate in the visualization process. So here systems should help us make better charts, make better design decisions. Similarly, optimizations to make visualizations scale to large data often rely on abstracting away the people. They rely on abstracting away that, what the user exactly wants to do. And this has been a, a quite successful endeavor to like, abstract away some of the details and just figure out the optimizations at a higher level. But because these tools have very little understanding of the user's goals, we're missing a lot of opportunities for optimizations. And I'm going to show you some examples where I leveraged an understanding of people's tasks and their capabilities to inform system design. Here, understanding the user and how they interact with their data has enabled me to discover new optimizations. And so these two research thrusts have led me to my mission, which is to develop tools for data analysis and communication that richly integrate the strengths of both people and machines. People have human intuition, and they are the ones who ultimately decide on the value that they derive from an analysis. Machines scale, and they reliably produce the same results. And so we want tools that help us benefit from both of these together. Following this mission, I have developed a number of systems that I will talk about today. In particular, I'm going to talk about four systems that are roughly in two groups. The first ones are formal models of visualization, where the goal is to provide guidance in tools to help us create better charts. First thing I'm going to talk about is Vega Lite, which is a high-level grammar for interactive multi-view graphics. And while Vega Lite is useful in its own right, the motivation was to serve as a representation for tools that generate visualizations. And this won a Best Paper Award at 2016, in 2016 at VIS. Draco then fulfills this goal of guiding, and, um, guiding in tools that help us create effective visualizations. But at the same time, by figuring out a way to actually build knowledge into tools, we're able to inform our understanding of visualization design. And this won a Best Paper Award in 2018 at VIS. What happened in 2017? Uh, Ham won the best paper award at, uh, at Invast. <laughs> um, then on the scalable visualization side, I'm going to show you user-centered optimizations uh, for making visualizations scale to large data. The first system I'm going to talk about is Falcon, uh, which enables interactions at an unprecedented scale. And I'm going to present that at Kai in a month. Uh, when we want to get even larger data and be able to visualize it, we need to resort to approximations. But approximations are approximations, and so there are potentials for errors. And actually, here at MSR, uh, together with Daniel Fisher and some other people from the uh, Vibe Group, we approached this problem from a user experience perspective. And we looked at how we can make visualizations uh, and that are using approximations more trustworthy. These four systems are part of my work on visualization tools for data scientists. And I'm happy to talk about any of these other papers and tools after my talk. Um, for now, I'm going to focus on these four, though. And let's uh, start talking about these formal models of visualization. If you have any questions, just feel free to interrupt me and we can, can talk about that. OK. So on this side here, our goal is to provide guidance in tools and help people create better charts. And what that means is that we want people to be able to create visualizations accurately that are accurately and easily understandable. And to do that, we have to apply the best practices and rules of effective visual design. And you've already seen some of these examples of choices that you might want to avoid when creating visualizations. To computationally reason about this design knowledge, we need to formalize it. And so that's why there needs to be a formal model of this design knowledge. This formal model needs to be expressed in some language. So what we need is some, some language, some representation to do that in. And this needs to be a convenient yet powerful representation. This representation should be declarative. 
because we want to reason about design, uh, not the, the, exec the execution. And then the declarative specification, we're separating the specification from the execution. The specification should also be high level with few constructs so that we can reason about it. And the way we're going to do that is through Vega Lite. Once we have this representation, we need to bridge the gap to actually guidance. And we can do that through automated reasoning uh, over this, this formal model of design knowledge. So all of this I've implemented in a system called Draco. Uh, so this gives you an overview of where Vega Lite and Draco fit into, uh, into this goal of providing guidance. So what we need to start with is this representation. And to talk about representation, let's talk about how we actually make visualizations. Usually start with some data set, like this one here about the weather in Seattle and New York. We'll pick some fields from this, like the city, date, and temperature, apply transformations to it to bin, aggregate, filter, and so on. And finally, create the chart. So what we want is we want a representation of this process, but we want a representation with few constructs. We don't want to enumerate all possible charts or all possible uh, combinations that you might do here. So to capture this process, using just a small number of building blocks uh, that compose, we're building on something called the gamma of graphics. Here, specify the data and transformations on this, that are operating on this data, and then the visual encoding itself. And the way we express visualizations in, this, in the gamma of graphics is as a mapping from data to visual properties of a mark, for instance, a line mark. So exactly for, for the chart that you've seen before, what we do is take the city field and map it to the color, which then creates one line for, for each city. And each of those also have a different color. We map the month to the X position and the average temperature to the Y. And so to express this in the gamma of graphics, we need scales, which are functions that map from the data domain to the visual domain. Guides, which are visualizations of these scales. So the guides are just an umbrella term for axes and legends. And you see the axes and legends here. And then finally, the, the mark, which are the data representative graphics. You could use points, lines, uh, or areas. But for this one, we're using a line to make this, this line chart. So these are the declarative concepts. But they need an actual implementation. And that is what Vega Lite is. It's a computational format for the building blocks of visualization. Here's what it looks like. We first specify the data, concretely the weather.csv file, specify the mark type, and then Vega Lite makes these encoding that describe visualizations very explicit by grouping related properties together. In particular, to make this chart, we have one X encoding that takes the month of the date and maps it to the X position, the average temperature to Y, and the city to color. These specifications are concise <coughs> because all we're doing is composing components rather than enumerating a particular chart type. There's no chart type line here. Um, it's, a, it's a mark type, and then together with encodings, you get a particular chart. But while it's concise, it's also expressive. By composing encodings and marks, Vega Lite supports an expressive range of graphics, including statistical graphics, such as this one here. Yeah? So I'm not from this field, so I, this may be an ignorant question, but is, is Wilkerson's work considered to be both sufficient and necessary for expressing everything you need to express about these visualizations? For statistical graphics, it's pretty. Do I have to repeat questions, by the way? Which or... Do you have to repeat questions? No. Um, the yes. Might be best yes. to okay. So the, the question was whether Wilkinson's grammar of graphics is uh, necessary and sufficient. Um, it's it's a pretty general concept that has been applied in both D three and uh, and ggplot and has become pretty popular. Um, and so I would say it's we have good indicators that it's necessary and sufficient. Uh, there's no there's no formal proof for sure. it. Uh, but it's, we're not the first ones to use it, and certainly not the last ones to use yeah. it either. Actually, they're celebrating the 25th anniversary of the, the publication of the original book this summer at Seattle in uh, such an American Statistical Society okay. Convention. So, as Susha said, we're, we're celebrating yeah. the 25th anniversary of that book. So, um, <laughs> it certainly had a lasting impact. So, mm -hmm. um, so with this, with building on the gamma of graphics, we're able to express 
the statistical graphics, such as this one here, that shows the temperature for different days in, uh, in Seattle for multiple years, as well as the precipitation on the size, and the weather type as the color. Um, this computational format for the building blocks of visualizations builds on the gram of graphics, but we extended it to also support things like um, composition to create these multi-view graphics. And we do this through operations such as concatenation, faceting, layering, and repeating. Here to show a summary and the raw data at the same time. So this static plot already provides a lot of value, but interaction adds another dimension to interrogate the data even further. Vigalite is the first language to introduce high-level declarative abstractions to make interactive charts. And so you can make this chart in a specification that is, that is fairly short. You can specify interactive charts with the same ease as you can specify static plots. Well, this specification here includes the visualizations, the visualization and all the interactions. If you want to learn more about Vegalite, you can go to our website where we have documentation, examples, an online editor, and, uh, and a lot more. The reason why we created Vegalite was for tools that generate visualizations. The concrete format is a convenient JSON syntax. JSON is native to the web and easy to generate from any programming language. Because we designed Vigalite in this way, it started an ecosystem of tools. Uh, for instance, the Voyager systems as UI tools and many other things. There are also, oh yeah, these Voyager systems. There are also a number of bindings for programming languages. And one that I'm particularly excited about is a language called Altair, which provides an alternative syntax for these Vigalite specifications, but in Python. What's great about it is that it uses the same concepts. And people are building these kinds of bindings for Vigalite in other languages, such as R, Julia, Elm, Scala, Haskell, and, and many others. <clears throat> building a community around this language has been very rewarding, but it also helped us define our research direction and drive the tool forward. Speaking of Python as one of these languages, uh, who here is using Project Jupyter? And Jupyter Lab? Turns out you already have Vigalite installed on your computer. Vigalite ships as the default plotting library in Jupyter Lab now. And Jupyter Lab has kind of become the most uh, popular data science platform um, for Julia, R, and Python. Hey, Dom. Yeah. I'm curious, a couple of slides back when you were talking about the language bindings. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sort of, I'm trying to figure out how that works. So, um, because Vigalite is so declarative, yeah. right? You don't typically compute things that are in there. So is the, are the language bindings mostly just to bind data to an otherwise fairly static Vigalite description? Or are people actually computing, using it to compute various visuals or marks or whatever? The bindings, what they do is they uh, generate the specification. So here, the specification that has uh, where you import Altair and load the data set, this part here then generates the JSON specification. But you have a Pythonic, a Pythonic API for it to generate that JSON specification. And then you use the Vega Lite compiler and runtime engine and so on to actually render the chart. I see. So all this does is generate the JSON. I see. And then this JSON gets processed by the JavaScript libraries that we have written. But the sort of computation that you can do in the language, is it mostly just to generate data, or do they... The computation do in, in which language? So if I were to write an Altair program, mm -hmm. as opposed to just a, a JSON file, um, one thing I could do is bind it to freshly computed data. Yeah. Um, is there anything else I would tend to do in those languages? So the question was, if you bind it to data uh, that might be, might be updating... Um, how would that maybe affect also the visualization then? Or would um, that automatically sure, re-render? that's fine with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so right now it doesn't, but we are certainly working on automatically when you start binding a data set to an Altair chart, and then you change that data set, you could automatically just rerun it. So you could make interactive applications through this. Okay. I think what Rob's asking right now it's mostly for rendering. Like your syntax here is just a way to, it's just a literals. It's a way to, yes. in Python, programmatically write a literal. And I think Rob's asking. Yeah, why do instead it of a literal? Why not? Why is there any literal? 
us the, you know, scope for doing computation and, and changing that instead of just having it be a literal. So the question is, the, if what we're specifying here is a literal, but can you actually do kind of computation in it? Uh, it's in a programming language. Yeah, right. What would you, what would one do? Um, you could, you can do computations in Python beforehand, before you pass the data to Fairlight. But then all you, all this is doing is generating the literal. So that's, that's what it does, yeah. Uh, so it doesn't do any. Purposely trying to keep some of that separation for, for the reason about the yeah. separation. Yeah, yeah, because then in the end, this JSON that you generate from here, Altair just passes it on to Jupyter Lab, which then takes care of the actual execution of it. So Altair actually doesn't execute anything here. Okay. That's, if, that's kind of what works. If the program, if the Altair construct is built with a variable, and the variable changes after the fact of the declaration, will the declaration itself change as the as variable changes, or that's a static operation? The once this once this is outputted, you can change the variables. It doesn't affect it, but that's just an inherent property of the Python right. runtime. I was, I was thinking it's if not that reactive. adds something on top of the declarative nature of, of Vega yeah. and suddenly makes it dynamic. Yeah, you know? we actually, if you use uh, Observable, which right. ha builds a reactive runtime engine, you can also use Vega there, and then you can actually hook into the reactive components of Vega. Um, so then you can make it but fully that reactive. All change the whole declaration as opposed to just. Unless it's really differential, like it's differential. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. So we can talk about that more of that later. There's a lot more things to talk about. Um, but I, I think here the fundamental difference: this is not reactive because it's in Python, because uh, the Python runtime engine is not reactive. There's Observable, which has a reactive runtime, and then you can also uh, benefit from the reactive runtime that Vega Lite or Vega has, uh, which I haven't talked about at all. But it's a lot more things to talk about. But let's jump to kind of impact. So Vega Lite now in Jupyter Lab. Uh, we have about 200,000 downloads on NPM, about a million on a CDN. So used in research projects at various universities to teach visualization design because it has these clean abstractions, featured by nature, used by various companies. And, um, and we're pretty excited about this uptake by the data science community of this tool that we've built at a, as a, in, a, in a research group. But in particular, not just the, lang not just the tool is... I think exciting, but Vega Lite was also praised by Brian Granger, who's the lead developer of Project Jupyter, as perhaps the best existing candidate of a principled lingua franca of data visualization. And so that's, that's part I'm pretty excited about, that really think about it from a language perspective, and not so, so much from a tool perspective. Okay, so to summarize, Vega Lite is easy to use for people because it has these concise specifications, reusable designs, where you can use the same design with different data sets easily. And it facilitates this rapid authoring for fast iterations, which is important for exploration. And I think the most important thing is that as a designer, you don't really have to think about the mechanics of making a chart, but you can focus on the data and the relationships that you want to show. Primarily, we designed Vega Lite for programmatic generation. So we have these declarative specifications where we are decoupling the execution and high-level domain-specific abstractions. And also these composable building blocks that allow us to express a large range of graphics with just small changes. Here, this whole space that you're seeing is a combinatorial space that's, des that's defined by atomic updates to a Vega Lite specification. So this describes a space, but just because we can render this space doesn't necessarily mean that all the charts here are useful or not misleading. So how do we reason about the space and actually provide guidance? And that's where Draco comes in where my goal was to provide a formal model of design knowledge for automated reasoning in tools that uh, generate visualizations. Concretely, what that means are, is that I wanted to enable automated design and critique, which would help people to author visualizations faster, but also make it safer to create these visualizations by automatically guiding designers towards effective uh, visual encodings. And I didn't just want to build tools on top of this, but also make this knowledge that we are building a shared resource, kind of a platform for a systematic discussion about design among researchers and practitioners. And so to, con to, to actually implement this, Draco consists of three components. The first one is a formal model of visual encodings as sets of facts. Second is design knowledge as constraints over these facts. 
And then a third mystery component that we're going to talk about later. So let's uh, dive into this representation first. What we want to do here is set up Draco to be able to reason over visualizations. And the specifications that we use in Draco is based on Vega Lite. But if you remember, the goal is to reason about it. And we also want to reason within an encoding or about incomplete specifications. So what I did was to flatten this representation. And that's the specification format that we use in Draco. And you can see that it fairly matches to the, the Vega Lite specification. As a representation, we use answer set programming, which is similar to Prolog or other log logic programming languages. What we can do with this is express this flow that you've seen before from data to a visualization in the end. But there's usually something more that we want to capture when we want to do a recommendation. Particularly, we know something about the data, some, some properties of these fields, and we want to use that to give better recommendations. Also, visualizations are not just created for themselves. There's, there's a user who looks at them, and they have a certain level of expertise and visual literacy. And they also have a task in mind, what they want to do with the visualization. And we should take that into consideration when we're making recommendations. This context is usually implicit and not formalized. So in Vega Lite, sorry, in Draco, I have extended Vega Lite to capture the context of the user's task and the data properties through additional attributes. OK, so this is the representation. How do we make the computer reason for us about, it, about this? And how do we bridge this gap between the representation and this reasoning? This is where this design knowledge over, as constraints come in. These constraints express preferences uh, that are validated in perceptual experiments as well as general visualization design best practices. There's three sets of constraints. The first ones are attribute domain constraints. They tell us what values can we assign to attributes. For instance, the mark type, which should be one of bar, line, area, point. And we can express this as constraints that look like this. We say there's a mark type, and the mark has to be of that type mark type, and it should be exactly one of those. We have formalizations of all the constraints, but I'm just going to show you the natural language uh, version of these for now. And of course, we don't have just constraints for the mark type, but also the encoding type, aggregation channels, and so on. Now that we know what values we can assign to attributes, we need to know what combinations are actually valid. And this is what the integrity constraints are for. They constrain the combinations to valid visualizations that satisfy the rules of visual design. These are hard constraints, meaning they can never be violated. And I implement about 70 hard constraints in the, in the Draco system. We have things like only continuous fields can be aggregated. So these are things you can't, you can't violate them. And lastly, we have preference constraints, which describe preferences within the space of visual encodings, of these valid encodings, as soft constraints. Here are a few examples. We prefer specifications with fewer encodings, because simpler is better. We don't want to use aggregation or prevent overlapping marks. And these, we have about 150 of these. And because these are soft constraints, means they can be violated. But if you violate them, you incur a cost. And then what the system can do is optimize the, the sum of these costs. You can see that here, the cost for the overlapping marks is the highest. So how do we use this? You can use this to, for instance, do visualization recommendation. And Sorry, what's, quick question. Yeah. Did you assign the costs to each of those? Did we assign the costs? Wait, wait, hold that. OK. Hold that thought. Did you do anything to uh, uh, validate the consistency of the hard constraints as a setup? Um, the question was, did we do anything to validate the consistency of the, con of the hard constraints? Um, in terms of what? They so they are mutually, they could be inconsistent, logically inconsistent. So well, then we would get no, so if they are logically inconsistent, we wouldn't get any answers. And we would know that pretty quickly. You might get any answer. Um, you might validate so everything. Ah, I see. Consistent. So we might violate every, uh, or um, accept everything. The l logic that we use is based on stable model semantics. And in stable model semantics, you don't have that issue. Okay. We'll talk more about that later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also a little surprised that the cost of the soft constraints is not task specific. So like the occlusion of marks, let's say, yeah. 
if my task is to look for outliers, then marks occluding each other doesn't matter because the outliers will still stick out. But if my task is to like, um, let's say do a comparison, um, then occlusion of the marks is really bad. Right? Right. So it seems like the cost varies depending on what the end task is. Yeah. So the question was that uh, the costs are not task dependent. Um, well, they, they actually can be. So you can write a constraint that says, if this task is this, don't do occlusion and give it a very high weight. And okay. you could even okay. give it a negative weight for another task. Um, these, this, it's always a trade-off between different constraints, and the weights give you a way to define that trade-off very explicitly. But you can express all of these things. Yeah. Uh, usually, the way you do it is you have like, very general high-level constraints, and then more specific low-level constraints that overwrite the high-level constraints. OK, so how do we actually use this? Uh, we can use this for recommendation where we can formulate this problem as finding optimal completions. So uh, for instance, we could say we want a visualization of the temperature. Translate that to the set of constraints, combine it with our knowledge base, and use a solver to find the completion, such as this chart here that shows us the spread of the temperature. But this is only the optimal completion according to those constraints. And that depends on the exact model. And you and I might disagree about the specifics of that model. But what's great about this is that we now have a formalization, so we can actually have a conversation about it. And also, Draco is primarily designed to support an interactive loop where the user can refine what they want to do uh, because no model, is, no model is complete. And so here, for instance, we might say this is not a great chart because we can't see how much data is at one of these points. So the user could come in and revise this and say, I want a bint temperature. Then we add that fact, and the constraint server might come back and say, oh, well, here's a chart. But if you remember the soft constraints from earlier, we had this one that said prevent overlapping marks. And it actually has a higher weight than adding another encoding that uses an aggregation. So in fact, what the optimal completion of this one is, it's, it's this histogram that really shows you the spread of the temperature, but also the counts in each value. So with this iterative approach here, where it's really an assistant and not trying to give you the optimal visualization, because that's not possible, uh, you get the benefit of scale of the computer that assists you, but also not lose the benefits of human expertise and intuition that really drives what the recommendation is doing. At the core of this are these, these weights. They're essential. So where, where do these come from? Well, the state of the art method for this is uh, something called graduate student descent, <laughs> where we essentially fiddled with the weights until we got the results that were consistent with the, with the research. But, I also came up with a more principled way that uses uh, machine learning, which is uh, the third uh, mystery component. So here we want to learn the trade-offs uh, between different constraints from data. What kind of data do we have, though? Well, ideally, we would have data of the form of some kind of partial input to a complete specification, because that's the data set, or that's the thing that we're recommending. But there's very little data that we could learn from that has this, this kind of form. There exists, though, an untapped resource of perceptual experiments that measure people's performance on a particular task. What's cool about this is you can, from this, infer pairs of ranked visualizations, where you know that one has a higher score than another. And do that if the score is significantly different. These pairs are great because they are ordinal, meaning we can combine the results from different experiments as long as they somewhat measure the same thing, but the measurement doesn't have to be on the same scale. And we actually did that and learned a Draco model from, one, from two data sets, one collected at the University of Washington and one at Georgia Tech. So how do we actually learn from this? First, we have as training data these pairs of ranked visualizations where one is better than the other. We featureize this by counting the number of violations of each soft constraint for the visualizations. So what we get are these two vectors, a positive and a negative vector, where each element is the number of violations of, that so of a soft constraint. So the length is always the number of soft constraints. And that's kind of a way to also engineer features. And then what we want to do is separate those vectors and find a, maximum dis find a, a way to get the maximum distance between them. And we do that through a method called learning to rank where we're essentially maximizing the, the weighted margin. What's nice about this is that this vector w, which, uh, which are the weights, 
um, these weights can be directly put back into the constraint program. And then we can use the constraint solver to find the optimal completions again. Uh, and it turns out if you write this in scikit-learn, that's like three lines of code. Uh, maybe a few more for like all the setup and stuff. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly standard method that works really well. OK, so we came up with this way to learn weights from data and then build a Draco model based on that. But what I think is exciting about this, about Draco in general, is that it's not just this one tool or this one model, but it really sits at the core of visualization research, where there's disparate areas of the, the theory side, where people are thinking of models of visual design. And what we can do with Draco is describe those, or learn them from data, and systematically improve them. There's the empirical side, where we could use Draco not just to model knowledge, but also to figure out what, what do we not know. Where are visualizations where our model that we currently have cannot distinguish visualizations? And we can use that by just looking at the, at the constraint program and then potentially automatically design experiments to fill those holes in our knowledge. And on the system side of the visualization community, we can help build automated design tools and even translate research into practical tools faster. And so what Draco and Vega Light together have helped us to do is create visualization tools where users can rapidly create good designs. But I started out motivating this talk that we need tools that not just provide guidance, but also work at the size that people need to work with. And this has been a challenge for a long time because scale overwhelms existing tools at every stage of the visualization process. So concretely, there are two distinct challenges when we want to visualize and interact with billion record data sets in real time. Big data is overwhelming, and it is slow to process. So let's look at these two challenges separately. First, how do we visualize a billion records? Well, the first thing we could just do is plot it. And um, Daniel's favorite uh, chart, uh, which is the, the big data scatter plot, um, where it's really hard to see anything because we just have this overlap. A standard solution is to sample, but it's really easy to miss outliers here and probably still hard to see the pattern in the data. A visualization where the scalability depends only on the size of the chart and not the size of the data is bin aggregation, where we're essentially discretizing the space and counting the number of records that fall into a bin. And now you can see that uh, we're, we're in building 99 here. Um, Draco could help us here to do this, for instance. What this bin aggregation does is that it decouples the visual complexity from the raw data through aggregation. We can use this to visualize other data sets, such as this one here, that shows the delays for different flights in the United States. Uh, this is a data set of about 180 million flights of all commercial flights since 1987 in the US. So by binning the variables and counting the records in each bin, we get a sense of the shape of the distributions of when, how, how much are flights delayed, or what time of the day do they leave. Or how far did they go? So visualizing a large data set this way isn't, isn't, isn't that difficult. But if we want to interrogate the data further and not just look at this one-dimensional distributions, we need interactions. And the challenge for analysis tools is to manage the amount of data and computation while remaining responsive. And so I address these challenges with my work on scalable visualization. Concretely, the challenge here is how do we interact with billion record data sets in real time? What we want to be able to do is operate at the, at the speed of human thought. So why is this real-time part so important? Well, if we have delays in interactive exploration systems, we break the perceived correspondence between actions and responses. We reduce engagement, and delays can also lead to fewer observations being made. Poor support for interactive exploration may even skew the analyst's attention towards convenient data with all the implied selection biases that come from this. So to address this, I've built a system called Falcon, where data exploration looks like this. I might start with this data set, uh, with the charts that you've seen before. I might want to know what makes flights arrive before their scheduled time. And the way we can do this is by filter in these charts and select some subset of the data and engage in something called cross filtering, where you can look at it let's say the early flights, and you see that it's the long distance flights that, arrive, that are arriving early. 
And it kind of makes sense because these are the flights that can make up for delays that might have occurred when they took off. If you want to look at the opposite and see what makes flights very delayed, you see more movement in this departure time diagram, indicating that it's the long distance flights that arrive, um, oh, sorry, the, the late flights. It's the late flights that arrive very late. And that also makes sense uh, because if there have been delays throughout the day, then the flights that are coming later can't take off early um, or can't take off on time. If you want to see whether this effect also generalizes to these long distance flights, so very, um, very delayed flights and very long flights, we can create two filters. So first, let's look at the flights that are uh, just 60 minutes delayed and then very far. And what, you notice, what you'll notice is some movement in this departure time diagram where the effect goes away if we're looking at, these, uh, at the long distance flights. But if we go to the short flights again, uh, the, you see this, this, this bump. And so this effect that we've seen does not, does not generalize. And interaction helped us find this pattern that exists across multiple dimensions, even though we only had one-dimensional charts. But in order to do, make this insight here, we actually used only a fraction of the data set. In particular, it was 0.008% of the data. So it is important to be able to interact with data at, at scale. So now you've seen it, it works. But how can Falcon actually be so real-time? How can it be so fast? Uh, allow me to answer the question I just asked and uh, show you the interactions a little bit and show a log of this. So you see a visualization of the interactions, the brushes. It first started in the arrival time diagram and then went to the distance one. And you can make a few observations here. Uh, we started with one chart, call this the active chart, which is the one that you're currently interacting with. And we only switched once which was the active view. Uh, we, um, so there was only one switch. But at the same time, even though there was only one switch, we did a lot of these brushing interactions, these, these single movements just by a single pixel. And so just looking at this, what we ideally would want is to prioritize, um, to prioritize the brushing latency over the view switching latency. And that's, that's actually a pretty, that's a principal trade-off that we're making here. We're making it because we know that these brushing interactions are much, much more common. But it also turns out that people are much more latency sensitive to brushing interactions than they are to view switching. It's okay if there's a delay. And so by building on this principal trade-off, the idea is to support brushing interactions with one view and then recompute when the user switches, which which view they are interacting with. Let's look at exactly how I implemented that. When we started brushing in one of the views, Falcon serves the request from a data cube, which pre-computes all possible aggregates. When the user then switches which view they're interacting with, Falcon computes a new data cube. And there's a little bit of delay while that happens. What's great about this is that the, uh, the data cube is constant size. It only depends on the number of bins and the number of pixels, but not the size of the data, which also means we can do these brushing interactions in constant time, and there's no bias towards a certain part of the, the data. And we can do it entirely in the client. What we, we've done here is use aggregation to decouple interactions from queries over the raw data. This might ring a bell. We did the same thing in these bin aggregate visualizations, but there was in the visual side, and here it's kind of in the interaction space. When the user switches the view, we have to recompute a data cube, which requires a pass over the data. But as I said earlier, these view switches are rare, and users are not as latency sensitive to them. The idea of using data cubes is quite attractive because they decouple queries from the raw data. But the big problem is that the size of the data cube grows exponentially with the number of dimensions. In particular, it's the product of the number of bins in each dimension. One way around this is uh, what people have done in, um, in nanocubes, where, which is a specialized data structure that levels, uh, leverages sparsity in these cubes. But these cubes are still too large for the browsers and take hours to build. Another idea is immense, which still assumes a dense cube representation, but it decomposes the full cube into 
overlapping cubes, which are of lower dimensionality. So what it means is we could have a cube for each pairwise interaction. But that also limits the interactions to only one brush at a time and the bin resolution. And still, it takes hours to build. Falcon makes a fundamentally different trade-off and limits interactions to only one view. And so we only need a linear number of these small cubes. And they're, in fact, so small that we can just build them on the fly, which means when the user switches, we can just recompute it. Uh, there's actually no large recomputation necessary. Uh, the, computing these cubes just requires a SQL query over some database system. And so because of these trade-offs, I was able to build this demo here, where you're looking at a data set from the Gaia Space Telescope that flies around the Earth and records stars. This is about 1.7 billion stars, a terabyte of data. And all these visualizations are running in a browser on this computer. And it's, it's better smooth because we decoupled the interactions from the raw data. And so with this, it's, we're able to interact with data sets that are three orders of magnitude larger than what was possible before um, in this, in this real-time regime. When I put this code online, a platform engineer at Stitch Fix found it and actually integrated it into their production environment. And then he called me up and um, was really excited about it. He said, with Falcon, it feels like I'm really interacting with my data, something that they weren't used to before none of the uh, visualization systems work at the scale in real time. So this is Falcon. And Falcon builds on the assumption that we can make a scan over the data set when the user switches which view they're interacting with. But what if the data is too large to even query it in reasonable time? And so here, we can't even really scan the full data set. And so making a static plot can already take too long. And as bad as, as bad as it is to wait for a single chart to render, this problem gets exuberated if we're in exploration, where we're making one chart after the other, where the insights from one depend on something that we've done before. Here, latencies reduce engagement and lead to a few observations. There's a well-known trade-off that we could make here, which is very attractive for data analysis, and that is to use approximation where we're trading off some accuracy for huge gains in speed. And this is a well-known trade-off uh, that's, that's used in a number of errors. And there has been a tremendous amount of interesting and impactful work to reduce errors. But in the end of the day, these approximations are still an approximation with some possibility for an error. And in this data exploration scenario where there's dependencies, because there's a small chance for every chart, the, the chance of an error having at least one error is actually quite large. And it gets larger as we look at more charts. So at the end of the day, users still have to make a choice. Do they trust the approximations or wait for everything to complete? And many are not willing to accept the possibility of errors. And so they have to uh, wait for everything to complete. And we found that actually at studies here, here at Microsoft. Well, users had to make this trade-off until um, Three, three years ago, uh, um, during my internship here at MSR, we came up with this idea of optimistic visualization, where the idea was to think of these issues with approximations from a user experience side, not so much as trying to reduce the errors, but like, what is the fundamental issue? And the fundamental issue is trust. You can't trust the results. So to address this, we started with the approximation that these approximations are mostly right, but we then offer a way to detect and recover from mistakes. In particular, analysts would start using the initial estimates, but then the system computes the true results in the background. So the analyst can continue their exploration using the approximations, but then when the system has finished the computation, it can tell users, oh, there was something that, that has changed fundamentally. And so you know that if there was something wrong, you will know about it. What this gives analysts is a, 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 um, a way to use these approximations, which are quite attractive because they are so fast, but still trust them. So we implement this idea in a system called Pangloss, where you have a visualization interface that also has these visualizations of the uncertainty that give you a sense of the potential of errors, as well as a sidebar that shows you a history of previous charts. 
And once these have finished and changed their color from orange to blue, you can click on them and look at the difference between the, the approximation and the, tr the precise answer, as well as looking at the true answer. We evaluated this system in three case studies at Microsoft, where we had people bring in actually their own data. We wanted them to explore data that they are intimately familiar with. And we found that approximation worked really well for, uh, for these analysts. Seeing something right away at first glimpse was really great. But there was also this need for guarantees. With a competitor, I was willing to wait 70 to 80 seconds. It wasn't ideally interactive, but it meant I was looking at all the data. And this was important for them. They had meetings where it was important to not say, oh, yeah, this, I think this is the right answer. Uh, they, had to, they had to have the certainty. The optimistic approach worked really well for them. One of the participants said, I was thinking of what to do next, and I saw it had loaded, so I went back and checked it. The passive update is very nice for not interrupting my workflow. So this is optimistic visualization, and I'm happy to talk more about this and the implications of this on the user experience after my talk. This concludes the discussion of the four systems that I've developed for my PhD. I've followed the mission of develop tools for data analysis and communication that richly integrate the strengths of both people and machines. In Vega Lite, what that means is that it's a language that helps you <coughs> author visualizations. The concepts that we have have cleanly mapped to code and then eventually to the chart that you make. But by designing for programmatic generation instead of just human authoring, we enabled new tools such as Altair. With Draco, we formalized design so that tools can apply this knowledge automatically. But by building Draco, we can also use it to inform our understanding of visualization, because we now have a formal model of it. With Falcon and Pangloss, I implemented a visualization system that scales to large data, and they leverage a deep understanding of how users interact with visualizations, which has enabled me to think different about the way we design and optimize systems. For the future, I'm excited to see how we can take these, these ideas and actually make them fully available in end-user tools. The challenge here is that what we need to do to get there is end-to-end -end integration into the tools that people are already using. And so this sets up a research frontier for Vega Lite and Draco. For Vega Lite, I am currently working on reducing redundant computation to make it scale to larger data. What that means concretely is that we want to take these data flows that describe a visualization, and we have an optimizer that takes, it, takes them and reduces redundant computation, as well as reorders computations to make it more, more efficient. And so we already have that working. But we're also excited to take some of these transformations and automatically push them to scalable backend systems. Uh, we have some prototypes of this, and um, ask me more after my talk about these links. On the Draco side, we showed the value of formalizing visualization design. And it, it helped us start a conversation in the visualization community about it. Now it is the time to tap into the potential of Draco. Together with people at UW and Apple, I'm working on tools to browse, update, and compare these Draco knowledge bases, these models that we built. And in particular, we're building UI tools where we want, want to be able to evaluate the impact of new perceptual models and really improve the model with the, the, the hand tuning much better. The goal then is to also integrate Draco into tools such as Altair, which could also help us to collect feedback from people who are actually using the, the recommendations, and then use it to systematically improve the model and continuously improve it using active learning methods. And I'm looking for collaborators there. I'm excited to also see how we could build domain-specific models. Draco currently targets these single-view specifications, but we could build the same for multi-view graphics or recommending interactions. Uh, we talked about big data already a little bit. Uh, we could automatically recommend uncertainty visualizations if we have a model of what good ones are. Or use it for education if we know if we have a model of how difficult is it to understand a visualization. We could automatically recommend visualizations that are targeting a particular level of education. And finally, I'm working with researchers at Northwestern NYU to see how we can expand the task model that's currently in Draco. 
We have a very simple one that supports values and summary tasks, but there exist more sophisticated task taxonomies, which uh, some people in this room have worked on, and we would like to actually put them into this formal model. Ultimately, what this work on Vega Lite and Draco should culminate in is some kind of runtime engine for visualizations, where analysts can look at their data regardless of the scale. And the system should automatically help them optimize the, the execution as well as the visual representation. What that means is to automatically apply Falcon's optimizations, combined potentially with approximation even. And uh, I've written about this at a workshop a couple years ago. The core idea here are these user and system aware optimizations, where we could, for instance, see that we automatically recommend aggregation for large data and approximation for very large data. Or take into account that if the user is on a mobile device, they not only have a smaller screen, but also have a slower network with more latencies and less memory. So can we take all of these things into consideration when we're providing recommendations and charts? And this might sound like a crazy idea because usually we don't think in the tools that we built uh, about taking specifics of the user into account or the, the system and, well, let alone both together. But with Draco, we can actually reason about how the analyst interacts with their data. In all of these things that I've shown you, I've demonstrated the benefit of declarative specifications and automated reasoning over these specifications, in particular for visualization. But visualization is only part of broader data analysis. And so I'm excited to see how we could use the ideas of, for instance, having a declarative specification in Vega Lite and then reasoning about it in Draco, but do the same thing for analysis more broadly. If we describe the analysis process declaratively, we can reason about it and automatically propagate errors or suggest certain data to look at, have richer visualization recommendations, warn people if they accidentally use their test data for training in the machine learning model. Uh, these are things that could be expressed as a query over a declarative specification. And so as exciting as it is to build tools on top of this, Draco allowed us to have a different conversation about visualization design because we have a formal model of it. And similarly, a formal model of the analysis process might allow us to have a conversation about different analysis styles and what it really means to do data analysis. So if you're excited about that, I'm happy to talk more. And thanks for your attention. Maybe a minor point. You mentioned through your presentation that you aim at make the systems and, and ideas easy to be used by people. But it sounds like people equals data scientists more than anybody you, you grab from a supermarket, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, so how will you characterize that people you talked about in your presentation? And I guess as a follow-up, you mentioned that you want to leverage human capabilities. Will people do really well? And, and make it part of the process. Can you enunciate what are those, uh, a couple of those human properties that you think are essential that machines don't have that you want to uh, leverage? Mm -hmm. So the first question was, uh, when I said people, I mostly focus on analysts here. And yes, I mostly focus on analysts because I only have one PhD time. Um, a lot of the techniques can also apply more broadly. So in particular, Vega Lite is not just being used for by data analysts, but also by journalists and scientists and, and others. And um, visualizations are made for the, for the general public. Uh, the recommendations in Draco could also be used for, for anyone, not just for, um, not just for data analysts. But the tools I've built mostly are targeted data analysts, because uh, that's been, been kind of my target audience, especially for the scalable visualization stuff. Those are the people who mostly face these, these challenges there. Uh, the second question was about um, combining I said that I'm combining the strengths of both people and machines, and, and why that? Uh, I think of visualization as one way to look at data. And, well, data, data exists in computers, and we somehow want to get a sense for the data. We could look at a table of that data set, but um, tables only give us so many values, and you have to actually 
actively read them. Whereas visualizations provide a really high bandwidth interface from computers to, to people. And we can leverage all our, our, our powerful uh, vision system and uh, to, to quickly see patterns and um, see problems potentially in data. The, whenever we're doing analysis, you, the people are ultimately the ones who are deciding what you actually want to do with it. Um, people are the ones who, can, who have domain knowledge, who have an understanding of, um, of the goals and potential errors and other factors that might influence influence the, the data set that you're seeing. Uh, they're the ones who understand if something goes, is completely wrong. Um, and so I think we always need this, you always need the human intervention. And so I see data analysis tools as assistance to the data analysts. And they should help us make the tedious processes, the tedious steps easier. So I think when we started having computers, they were able to compute numbers and quickly add numbers. We could have added those numbers by hand, but I think computers are much more scalable and do it much more reliably, so we, we should leverage that. Uh, today, with tools like Voyager, for instance, we are able to automate some of the hard parts of exploratory analysis. Exploratory analysis being this, uh, this process that you go through when you're first getting a data and you want to get a sense for it. There's usually two challenges. The first one is, in order to do this exploratory analysis, you want to look at a lot of charts. And so that can be quite tedious to make all of these charts. And second, you want to follow the best practices of making, doing this analysis, which is to start broadly, looking at all the universe summaries before diving into specific questions. But it turns out that's not how, when we, when we look at data, we usually operate. Uh, we often look at something and then we see something interesting and we dive into those questions. And we've seen that in, um, in classes and in interview studies. So Voyager there helped to automate the tedious parts by giving you a gallery of visualizations. And also, this gallery shows you the universe summaries first. So there, here we have this automation of the tedious parts and guiding people to follow best practices. Uh, Jayco did something similar for visualization, where it automates the tedious parts of specifying all the details of a chart, but it also helps you follow best practices, um, similarly for Vegalite and similarly for all these other systems. So that's kind of how I, how I see this to working together. So it's a lot of words for a uh, short question, but. I think you get a sense for it. <laughs> I kind of want to flip uh, exploratory analysis on its head and say, okay. how, do we, how do we design for presentation? So you can imagine Power BI and Tableau make up a market that's multi billions of dollars. And we kind of leave, all these tools kind of leave the design aspect up to the authors. Mm -hmm. So we kind of say, like, you know, it's on you, the authors, to like make good visualization. And it's on you, the consumers of those reports to actually understand what's going on. So how do you think your systems can help to kind of maybe solve the blank canvas problem or so to help enhance yeah. uh, consumer experience? So the question was, how do we design for a presentation? And just for a little bit of context, in the visualization community, there's kind of these two things that we're designing for, for exploration or an exploitation, or for presentation and analysis. And these are kind of two, considered two separate things. Uh, I actually personally think those are closer than they, than they often are perceived to be. Um, and I think a lot of the tools that I've built can help with, with, the, with the presentation aspects as well. Uh, Vega Light visualizations are highly customizable. You can customize really all the, you can create themes, you can create, uh, customize exactly what you want the axes to be and the legends and, and marks and so on. Um, another problem that you pointed at was the, the blank canvas problem where uh, if you're making a chart, you sometimes don't really know where to start. And I think Draco can be really helpful there by yeah, showing you. Like, especially with the task, because like I think. With what? what with the with task. task. So the task. author knows, hey, I want to be able to see outliers in this data. That can be a really powerful kind of primer to say, oh, I'm going to look at this class of visualizations. I'm mm -hmm. kind of skew maybe bar charts because they're aggregating too much. I'm going to look at scatter plots for other kind of unit visuals. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you brought up this point of uh, there's, there's a task, and if the user knows the task, then you can provide recommendations to visualization that show that. Uh, what's I think neat about Draco is that because of the constraints, it can operate in any, or you know, information can propagate in any direction. So you can lint. You can, you, can, you can also use it for linting, which actually people at MIT are, are doing right now. Um, but the, 
this multi-directional multi thing is pretty great because you could say, for this data set, what is the optimal, optimal according to constraints, optimal visualization? For a particular task, what's the optimal visualizations? For a particular task and data, what is the optimal visualization? Or for a particular visualization, what's the, what's the, what tasks does it solve? And you could go in any direction here, as long as the weights and soft constraints and hard constraints are set up correctly. Of course, that's, that's an assumption here. Um, and so I think it can be very powerful there. The biggest challenge for tasks, I think, is to figure out how do we actually get to that? Because uh, we're not going to have a drop down in a UI that says, which task do you want to do today? I would like to do the uh, summary task. Um, I think there's a huge potential for inferring these partial specifications from natural language queries, for instance. Because language is ambiguous and there's usually some intent that you can derive from it. And we could use that to then provide recommendations with it. So I think Draco could be very powerful in, in here because we wouldn't have to build an end-to-end -end model where we say natural language to visualization, uh, which, has a problem that, which is a problem that people have tried to solve, but it's, it's, it's tricky. But instead, we could do natural language to partial input, which I think is a much more solvable problem, and then use Draco for the rest, which has en encoded all this information and knowledge about visual design. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I guess to go back to the beginning of your question about like presentation, I, th I think there's actually something interesting about not thinking of them as something too different. I often think of exploration actually as presentation to myself, uh, sometimes my future self, sometimes my past self, I don't know. Uh, and when we're presenting a chart to someone, they are going to look at it and do some kind of inference on it. So they're also doing analysis on it. So I don't know that the visualization itself would be vastly different. Uh, the process of making the chart is different. Like in an analysis tool, you have, also, you have to make more charts, and you have, you have to actually know that you're not making like, wrong insights, and probably also have your like, data processing stuff there. Whereas if you have a visualization that somebody made for you, they probably tried to tell you a story, and they hopefully made sure that that story is consistent with the data and that there's um, that they're not accidentally misleading the, the reader. Um, yeah. But I think those two are, I think they should be closer to other, together than, than more separate. Yep. So did, I just want to return to part of what you said about Draco. So to train the, the rule weights, um, it sounds like you sort of systematically reviewed the literature and encoded it as these pairs. Yep. So I'm, I want to hear a little more about that. So like, how many papers are we talking about? And how straightforward was it to decide like, to encode it as pairs? Like, did it always work out? Or sometimes did you say, I don't know if this paper is really, you know what I mean? Like, was it a good fit all the time? Or was it sometimes awkward? Yeah, so the question was about uh, how did we, actually, did we actually build the Draco model? Yeah. And uh, we reviewed the literature. So, and, and you said to build the, the system. Um, let me distinguish a little bit between what we could do and what we have actually done. <clears throat> so I talked about the machine learning part as one way to get the, the weights. The model that we ship actually doesn't use those trained weights because there are no comprehensive data sets that are large enough to actually train a full model. So the way we tune the weights is, um, is, is by, by tuning them by hand. But I think the more important aspect actually of Draco are the hard constraints and the soft constraints. So where do those come from? Uh, the hard constraints are informed a lot by just the experience in our group of making charts, building chart tools. Um, the three came out of our group, the, the Perfuse and, Perf, uh, and uh, Protovis from Jeff, and then uh, the Voyager system. Um, and a lot of the knowledge that we've gained there um, made its way into Draco. Uh, a lot of the rules in Draco are, are taken pretty much directly from CompassQL, uh, which is the underlying engine that's uh, under, under Voyager. Uh, so the, the rules are coming from, from a lot of these systems. And most of the rules are actually fairly obvious rules. Like, you, can't, you can only make a bar chart if you have um, one continuous. You can't have continuous, continuous, and make a bar chart. Or, or discrete, discrete, you can't make a bar chart. And it turns out uh, not many people have actually written papers about these super obvious things, but those you need to actually know about if you want to build a system that works on it. Um, so the majority are these fairly obvious things. 
Uh, a lot of other rules were then just the best practices of visual design comes from our experience with building tools as well as looking at things like Tableau and, uh, and ggplot and others and uh, taking inspiration from those. So following the best practices. And then there's the, the rankings of where we use effectiveness rankings, building on work, starting with Cleveland and McGill and APT and, and lots of other things that came afterwards. Um, I can't give you an exact number of how many papers we looked at, but certainly we read the literature and um, made sure that it's consistent with, with those things. Mm -hmm. I haven't really found many uh, conflicts between different papers. Uh, which I think is uh, partly because we, we really looked at the rules that are generally applicable. Um, and there's also an interesting conflict in the visualization, in visualization research between the really, really low level perceptual rules and perceptual research where we know, okay, if a pixel is here and a pixel is there, like this is how different they look and if they're here, this is how different they look. Um, and the very high level of, yeah, don't make 3D pie charts. There's very little that actually connects those two right now. And I think with Draco, we can start to have a conversation and figure out, okay, how do they actually, where, where do they meet? And how do, might we be able to use these low level rules to infer these higher level rules of don't make 3D pie charts? Um, but a lot, of, a lot of the knowledge that goes into systems right now is this you know, best, following best practices. So Dominic, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. but the, the UW and the NYU studies that you referred to were specifically uh, in, a, in a limited domain, you actually had these sort of mechanical Turk-like studies where they were yeah. doing comparisons between X and Y and ranking. So for those two papers, you were able to code those. And that those, I think, were one of the ones you learned on. Yeah, so I learned one, the one from UW was on scatter plots with three encodings, where two of them had to be X and Y. The other one was size or color or, I think, row. Um, and it only looked at the, like, six or so uh, task types, uh, which you could essentially boil down to these two task types of summary and value. Um, and so you can see that's a tiny, tiny subset of all the possible charts that Draco can make, let alone what Vega Light can make. But um, we were able to use those to, so it wasn't a, you know, we're gonna scan a hundred different papers and, and, and derive the, those were, these were- So this is for the machine learning part. For the yeah, for the machine learning part. For the actual model that we have that has the hand-tuned weights, those are mostly based on the Voyager weights plus a little bit of additional weights for like the task stuff that Voyager doesn't even have. Um, and there what we did is generate visuals, generate recommendations and look at them in the UI tool and see whether they make sense. Uh, and keep fiddling with the weights until it does. And so to make that process a little bit more principled, we're working on this, uh, this Draco tuner that I alluded to a little bit, uh, where we're starting to build a test set of examples that we want to be, where we we want the order to be a particular order. Uh, we will make it very easy to create new pairs and to then also change the weights quickly, change the weights and quickly see what effect does that have on the recommendations. Um, when I built the, the model that we have, that we had in the Draco paper, it was really me changing a weight and then rerunning some process and looking at a few, a few examples uh, in like a file browser. <laughs> um, the, the process wasn't, wasn't very comprehensive, but we really need your idols to be able to do that. Um, I really see Draco as the infrastructure that we need to do that. And I think it's a very clean way to model visualization knowledge and build knowledge on top of. Um, but I don't think the model that I've built, the particular one, is the final answer. It certainly isn't. I know a lot of problems with it, so, uh, yeah. Just a thought. Um, mm -hmm. See if this helps formalize things even better for Draco. I know you talk about, I always get antsy when people try to automate design and, and thinking that this yeah. knowledge is this thing that you can commit to paper and their rules when it's this really this yeah. ambiguous very thing. It, it feels that like what you're formalizing there is, is perceptual properties of people. Mm -hmm. um, and because all those constraints seem to, seem to refer directly to. Um, People really are, have difficulty perceiving differences between things that are overlapping yeah. or things that are color uh, too close to. It feels that you're more close to encoding perceptual lessons than the sign itself. You might. I agree. Because I'm trying to think, mm -hmm. 
how to how to give even more 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 steam underneath to 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 help formalize. Because as we discover more about the way we process information, perhaps relative to the task, uh, Draco will accumulate will, will welcome those. Whereas design is such a fickle thing, and I can see a system that really puts them on rails as to these are the proper graphs mm -hmm. you need to produce because they're perceptually <clears throat> good versus I don't care, just want pie charts. Like a good designer knows when to break the rules. Well, yeah. yes. Um, so it's not even a question. It's perhaps a, a conversation to have about, you know, refining the language you use may help you focus um, on goals in a different way. So, so your point, I'm just going to repeat it because it wasn't a question, um, was about that Draco doesn't really encode design, but more what it encodes are these perceptual rules it's and well, best practices. It's more practices. a question than a statement. I mean, do, yeah. do we think that it's encoding design or truly actually perceptual? Well, we know about perception. Yeah, I've, I've, I've grappled with this. Um, and I've come so for, this, for this talk, and when I talk about it, I talk about design and best practices as, as encoding those. But really, I think it's, it's encoding uh, rules of perceptual, perceptual design, uh, or sorry, perceptual, uh, perceptual rules of making, making charts. Um, because we're mainly targeting the exploratory analysis scenarios, or the sorry, data analysis scenarios, not just exploratory analysis, data analysis scenarios, the, the process of designing a chart is usually a data analyst in a notebook making a chart, designing a chart. Uh, I, I, think, I, I think of those two as interchangeably. So I think of a person who makes a visualization as a visualization designer. If we're really thinking about design as this creative process where you're trying to tell, where you're telling a story and where you're trying to find colors that are um, in, invoking certain, certain associations or maybe you try to intentionally make certain parts harder to read of the chart, those are all things that uh, I think are far outside of what Draco is, is targeting. I think Draco could help you to say, hey, you're breaking a rule here. But then you can, as a designer, you can say, yep, thanks for telling me. I know. And I'm glad, I'm glad you told me, but now no, I know. Uh, it could help designers who are not as experienced to know that they're breaking a rule. <laughs> um, you could even make a model that breaks certain rules intentionally. Um, so yeah, design is and remains a process, a creative process that I certainly do not want to automate. Um, again, the goal for, for all these tools is, is to be an assistant that helps you with the tedious parts and warns you if you're doing something that doesn't follow the best practices. And you can do whatever you want with those, with those warnings, um, but at least we can provide those warnings. Up to the end, uh, mm -hmm. unless there are any other questions, and check one last time online. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, there were questions. Yes, I've been checking. No, 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 on my questions. So okay. let's let's thank our speaker. Thank you.